Great. And, uh, hello. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Mia Willemsa. I am from South Africa. I'm a journalist for a news TV channel. And I just want to make a comment about the education there. Yes, I agree. We have improved and we've come such a long way. Um, and I think when I meet a lot of the international journalists here, the one thing I can say about South Africa is that it's not so bad as you think. And, but still, um, at the moment, at home, we have a situation where the Limpopo government, they haven't um, uh, given textbooks to a lot of the schools in the province. And to me, I just feel I would love that uh, the international world, world would ask a little bit more questions, put a bit more accountability on the government in South Africa, mm -hmm. because education is a basic thing and a textbook is actually one of the, the things, the most basic things. So more questions, guys. Pressure the government in South Africa. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for that initiative. I think that was more an exclamation mark um, than a question to the audience, uh, uh, to, to the panel. So please continue with your question, sir. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, I'm Kalinga Ratna. I'm a Sri Lankan living in uh, Singapore. Uh, we are talking here about sustainable development. I didn't hear the word greed mentioned uh, in the discussion because uh, uh, a sustainable uh, development uh, needs to go hand in hand on how we can uh, 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 control our cravings, uh, our greed for uh, things we don't need. Uh, for example, we talk about the Arab Spring a lot of times. But I'm still not con convinced that it's, uh, it's about freedom, or um, I think it's more about uh, the greed for oil resources. So why are we afraid to talk about greed in this sense? Because now in Asia, uh, we are having the same issue. We are talking about uh, development and uh, catching up with the West. But uh, uh, there was a discussion uh, last week in Singapore where one Malaysian said we should uh, we were talking about sustainable development and social justice. And one Malaysian uh, argued that we should take a leaf out of China's one family policy and the government should in, uh, introduce a one car policy. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have a, a nightmare, environment, environmental nightmare in the cities, which we s still see. Then all the major religions talk about greed, curbing greed, but even the religious leaders are not talking about how to curb greed. 1997, we had the Asian financial crisis. It's about people trying to live beyond their means. And today we have the same crisis in Europe. Again, it's about people trying to live beyond their means. So why are we not talking about greed when we talk about education for uh, sustainable development? Thank you very much for that input. Um, um, let's, anyone quickly, with a quick answer to the last remark? Mr. Pogba, I always look at you. And <laughs> maybe Dennis first. We agree. <laughs> You agree? Okay, fine. In so many words, they all agree. Um, we have a number of uh, more questions. Uh, so the gentleman over there, I probably oversaw somebody. There was a lady. Yes, please. And you're next. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Daya Trusu. I'm a professor of international communication at the University of Westminster in London. And uh, I, was, uh, I have a brief comment and a question. The comment is about the, the China model of development. Uh, the Chinese have been able to raise 300 million people out of poverty in the last two decades, which is unprecedented in human history. And that was not done through um, you know, Western aid, the reactivist state, which did what was needed. Um, India has also been able to raise 100 million people out of poverty in the last 20 years. Um, India is more complicated, as we know, but, you know, there's progress. Um, literacy rate in India, according to 2011 census, was 74%. Um, when the Brits left us in 1947, it was less than 18%. So let's not undermine these major achievements. Um, my question is um, for a uh, friend from um, the, the, the um, Frankfurt Book Fair. Um, I have always worried about the limitation of academic textbooks to countries in the global south. 
as a published author, I've got two dozen books, no, sorry, a dozen books and I edit the academic journal. And I always find it problematic that, you know, books are priced at such high level that it's almost impossible even for well-resourced developing country um, universities to get even a single copy. So my question is, why is it not possible to produce books in local locations? Um, now the technology allows us to do that. Why not have more e-books and have special tariffs for countries in the developing world? Why not have much greater uh, relationship between academia and publishing world and, and stop treating them as, as free labor? Um, I think the technology now exists to, to take that shift in thinking. Um, and it's not just about university, you know, it's about school textbooks also. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I think uh, we got the gist of your question. Um, keep your question in mind. Jürgen, I think you were the one uh, uh, who was uh, put in question, or your industry was put in question first. You. Okay, <laughs> Sorry, no, I was, I was really uh, one step ahead. It Sorry. Was a little confusing, <laughs> yeah. No, um, actually, uh, 20 years ago, I was in charge at a large STM scientific publisher for textbooks, academic textbooks. And I, I, I printed a series of textbooks for India, which were 10% of the price, same price it would have been in Europe. So we'd always tried to price to the market uh, at that time. But we had the cost of shipping, and so we tried to print in India. But it was all complicated. We tried to do it. But then after one year time, I had all these books for India back in Western Europe. Yeah, mm -hmm. So this was an issue of free importing. So it got a little difficult. Now, this is 20 years ago. Now everything is, is uh, as we think. It's digital. But then again, we think of iPads, Kindles, whatever. They are very expensive. And the government, like the Brazilian one, wants now to give all the, to all the schools, wants to give sort of simple an iPad, but this is a large money which we probably cannot, India cannot spend as much money. So people are going for mobile tele uh, uh, communications, for mobile phones, smartphones, where it might be easier to deliver textbook content. Mm -hmm. And it might be easier actually to develop in India their own textbook content. Textbook publishing has been always very driven by UK or American publishers. And this is again, what kind of information gets to the people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if it's only if there's only one source worldwide, which is the Western world, the European world. So I, I think what has to happen first, we have to think of the content, and the content shouldn't come anymore from, from Europe, but the content should come out of this country. And then we should think about technology, and then we, technology has to be affordable again. So we have to make another step. And then again, it's, we need the teachers, we need the people who teach the people how to use this technology. Yeah. So it's, it's a lot of different issues which have to be solved till a country like India really has access to electronic information and to cheap textbook content. But it's going to happen, and it's happening at the moment. Can I jump here because Please. this excites me? I mean, this is where I get as passionate as my fellow participants. Um, I used to work in the media and entertainment industry and observe it for a long time. And many years ago, we were having discussion here about the model being disrupted by the digital world. It's happening the same in the publishing and education industry, exactly the same. And you're going to see at this stage, except for a few examples like Khan Academy Online, um, the models are as faulted as the music industry at the, at the beginning or the publishing industry of newspaper where they were trying to embrace internet. What they would do, they would like try to sell you the entire CD online or scan the print copy of the newspaper and put it online, right? No unbundling of the articles, no interactivity, nothing. And if you go around and you see an educational experience today online, it's Harvard, it's MIT, it's even Stanford. What they do, they film professors and they put it online. How boring is that? When internet provides you interactivity, exchange, peer-to-peer -peer communication, contribution from different sources, how boring is that? So it's a matter of innovation. It's a little bit 
of a business model uh, acumen as well. How can you create, if you want, an iTunes of learning experience? And most probably Mr. Steve Jobs wasn't that. We already had it. But I know that Apple has an academy and they're looking at that too. So sorry if I come back in with the business. But this is like a sustainability of education to learn more about sustainable development as well. So I'm excited and I think all of us in this room can contribute to this because as journalists, um, as I said, you not only inform, but you can instruct, and this is what uh, he was saying about giving contest. And I think if even the media outlet turn a little bit more into learning spaces where you moderate a conversation among people that can teach and be taught, um, at times even with a little bit of game interaction, someone was saying, how do you get the kids to learn? Well, the Khan Academy method is all about scoring points. The more you learn, the more you go up or the more you have understood that concept, the more I give you more content. Anyway, sorry, this is like my usual tangential way of thinking, but I think there is an amazing potential in this space. Um, it's chaotic, as it was the beginning of the music revolution in digital, or was the beginning of the publishing in digital, but there is a little, I don't know if you've seen it, there is this little video on YouTube of these kids that touch a traditional magazine like this and says, mom, it doesn't work. So, Technology is becoming more intuitive. You don't need to go to school to learn it. It's becoming cheaper. I don't use it as a panacea because it requires all our intellectual uh, ability, but I'm really excited about the opportunity. I know Dennis is gearing to talk, but, but if you could also take my question uh, into account that I would like to sort of uh, um, extrapolate from that. We've been talking about um, different technologies opening up new avenues. We've seen that um, mobile phones have changed the way that African women go to markets. Their, their market decision is decided by having access to quick information in a different way. Do you see that maybe also as a chance uh, for areas that otherwise had problems getting enough books? Yes, uh, yes, I do, of course, because where you don't have books and you don't have libraries, how do people have access to education or, or information in the short term? So clearly, that's, it's, uh, we, we can't ignore this. To give one example of the work I'm involved in, I work with uh, an organization that's produced a portal, an internet portal called gesichter-africas.de. And it's about countries south of the Sahara, not just their geography and their minerals, but about their peoples, their cultures, their languages. And it's wonderful that young German people mainly would have access to this information. But I would like to see it translated into English so that perhaps three quarters of Africa could have access to information about Africa. They know about their neighbors. Mm -hmm. We have the African Union, we have the desire for cooperation. We need to be trading between each other and having cultural exchanges, especially cultural exchanges, because that's where our humanity gets tra uh, transferred and explained, and uh, I would like somebody to come along and say, here's 30,000 euros, do it. Do, do, do you follow? And there are lots of opportunities like this, but it doesn't take the place of books, and you're right, it doesn't take the place of books written in, can I call them the former colonies, where people are free and need to transform the understanding of their own experience. This is crucial, because the, the understanding of our lives in South Africa, and we have a question about, ask questions of the government. The question I ask of my people in South Africa is you are now free, you are managing the education system, mm -hmm. why aren't you providing the textbooks? It's not up to the president, it's up to people. Why are they so neglectful? Thank you very Thank much. You. Talking about systems, um, and I'm looking at uh, Ursula. Um, uh, systems is, of course, something uh, that sort of official development cooperation can uh, help assist. And you said, you know, we need to react to local demand. We do not sort of push whatever um, might be a German idea onto uh, education system uh, in, in um, our partner countries. How does it work then? I mean, how do you select the right system to work in? How do you sort of maybe put pressure on... Uh, in this case, and let's keep South Africa just as an example for many other countries, um, on, on government saying, you know, you might need to do a bit more. We can help you, yes, but you need to do it. 
Well, I can pick up on what Professor Goldberg said. It's important that there's not just a school building and the teachers are employed and kids go to school. It's that they learn something. And for that, the teachers have to be present. For instance, in one African country, um, teachers were just not at school. So uh, there was an initiative, a local initiative, that um, a, a poster was put up outside the wall of the school with giving all the names of the teachers that were paid by the local government. So everyone could see, oh, well, they are not here. They are doing some shopping or they are elsewhere. So to hold them accountable, and I think that's very important. This can only happen, happen locally. We can provide money for schools, for teachers, um, salaries and whatnot, but it's important that they learn something because I think every government understands that there is no sustainable development without education. Last question, and then the two, yes, you can, you can give an applause. Just because I'm talking doesn't mean that you have to stop. We have lost a little bit the sustainable uh, about the education because maybe also Dennis from, from right from a moment sort of put uh, sustainability into the area where what is needs to be kept that way. We're not talking about sustainability in the um, social way and the way that the resources are distributed in this world. But uh, let's talk about sustaining the planet. How important and is that in education and can you educate for sustainability? I think uh, you better can uh, educate for sustainability because we depend on it. Uh, if we are to have a reasonable chance to reach in the year 3000, not to speak of the year 10,000 or something like that, we need fundamental change, both structural in the institutional design of countries and the world at large, and we also need a cultural change. And here, one important thing that we haven't talked about yet is overpopulation. So the number of people who will live on this planet in 2100 could be anywhere between 6 billion and 16 billion, depending on uh, rates of procreation, total fertility rates, and so on. And a hugely important factor driving population growth is poverty again. Poor people, countries like Niger, Senegal, and so on, you have total fertility rates, which is the number of children per woman, uh, that lie around six or seven. In a hundred countries in the world, mostly uh, wealthy countries and middle class countries, that rate is already below two, two, which is the rate of reproduction. So we want these rates to come down in the poorer countries and we want to, them to come down fast. But again, in order to achieve that, we need education for women, that's the key factor, mm -hmm. giving women something else to do other than procreating, other than raising children, getting them an education that qualifies them for jobs where they can earn a living. And of course we need social security so that people don't find that having surviving children is the only way to provide for their old age. So I think looking ahead 100 years or 200 years, that is the most important thing for sustainability. We need to get the human population to a level of roughly six or maybe five billion rather than the horrific 16 that is now on the horizon. Whereas the education of women is sometimes difficult because people don't like people, uh, women to be self-determined and know about their bodies and uh, everything else. I have an answer to this problem of overpopulation. It's a very simple one. It's about television. When you had a blackout of electricity in the United States, <laughs> nine months later, a lot of babies were born. So give people something else to do. Let them watch soapies. <laughs> then there won't be babies born. Right, but let them do something proper and something that will help our world. Now, I have a promise to you. Five people with their statements and maybe could you do it briefly. The lady has been waiting for a number of uh, minutes now. The gentleman has been sitting down there. Uh, I've had a, somebody uh, putting up his finger there. So another two in a second. So these three first and then another two. Yeah, press the button yes. as in the early parliament. Yes, uh, thank you. My name is Cornelia Naun. I'm uh, with the uh, non-profit uh, Mundus Maris Sciences and um, Arts for Sustainability. Um, and when we reflect and work on uh, education issues for sustainable development, also in practical terms, in some test cases in Gambia and Senegal, for example, um, we find that uh, and in line with the UN, uh, UNESCO decade for uh, reorienting teacher education for sustainability, 
uh, we find that one of the key issues is to support and empower teachers to teach the values that will make the difference. That, and the, these values, we have to impart them uh, by mentoring the young people on their, on their way to an adult life so that they care enough about them to act. And uh, as has been repeatedly already mentioned by the panelists, our, our lifestyles here in Germany, in Europe and uh, so on, are really not the model. Um, on the other hand, we know uh, from uh, social science research that the, ha the level of happiness does not correlate uh, with wealth, with material wealth, as soon as your basic needs are uh, satisfied. Uh, then, uh, in, in our practical work, say in West Africa, we are exactly confronted with what has already been raised, particularly that there are no culturally um, uh, customized uh, uh, teaching aids, uh, books, and so on. And we would very much like to have cooperation with people who are in that sector to help create the conditions that local people can provide their contact. I've been going through bookshops and so on, trying to buy books for these schools, and it's hardly anything you can find because all, it's all around our Western models, which are, t which are simply not pro a possibility to propose to these people. So how to create content and delivery mechanisms that are accustomed and cheap enough so that there are a real probability. Because otherwise, for many of these people, now it makes a lot of economic and other sense to migrate because many of the economies depend on mm. primary extraction. And if they want to develop new options, they also need the support for building their educational uh, offers to the next generation, thinking about the fact that most of the population is below the age of 20. So the need is huge, and uh, I would really welcome uh, concrete proposals by the professionals here to get something happening. Thank you. They have noted it. Are the gentlemen over there? I'm, Iman I'm Emmanuel Okbabio from Nigeria. I'm directing my question to the professor that presented. Uh, I think in your presentation you said about uh, advocating for global governance in education and uh, sustainable development. I'm wondering if it is going to be a kind of an arrangement to incorporate stakeholders or institutions. Because why I'm saying so, you, we already have some organizations, global arrangement that set standard and norms about uh, achievement in that direction for which progress are measured based on statistics, of course, which do not reflect the realities on grounds. And so I want to know, please, how the, nat the nature of that global governance will be in terms of... Uh, the Thank you very much. Uh, that's also been noted, and the gentleman who'd been standing up. Thank you. Um, we often talk now about... Uh, Could you introduce yourself again? Thanks. Okay, my name is Pilanim Tembu. I'm from South Africa. Um, we often talk about uh, shifts in global power. We talk about the rise of emerging powers. But now we understand clearly that the Western models that have been used for the past, let's say, 400 years are not sustainable. They cannot be replicated. And if they do uh, become replicated, we're really leading each other to self-destruction. Um, now, how do we incorporate this knowledge that we already clearly have into the education system so that moving forward we actually do develop, but sustainably, but also with different values, not only material, but where we balance issues of uh, material, spiritual growth, and we're not only, for instance, glorifying technology, but forgetting that we're polluting rivers, we um, creating actually um, gains, but at the expense of other human beings. So how do we incorporate all this knowledge into this topic of education and sustainable development moving forward? Thank you. Thank you so much for that question.